Can you join me in welcoming Keith, Keith Warrington. He's very nice, your pastor, isn't he? He's got a lovely, gracious way about him, and that was a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. And it is lovely for Judy and myself to be back with you. Uh, a couple of people have said, uh, welcome home, and that's nice, and we feel at home. Um, getting to know some of your faces, getting to know some of your names, especially nice to be with uh, Chris and Lisa and spend time with them. We wondered whether we were going to make it. Um, as you may know, Britain is blanketed in snow, and where we live, there is about two foot of snow currently, and uh, there was a serious danger that we wouldn't be able to get out of our drive, let alone out of our village. So we actually came down to London a day earlier just to make sure that we caught the flight, although it was always a bit troubling. I've never been there before, sitting on a plane watching them de-ice the, uh, the wings as we took off in a blizzard. But we've come here, and now it's warm and sunny, and I might even take my jacket off. It's so unusual. So as Pastor Chris said, we're here for uh, the next four weeks, and uh, <clears throat> I've got a plan. Uh, we're going to look at one gospel every Sunday session, and it's the kind of gospel that I would take with me if I was going to go on a desert island and I was going to be there for a long period of time, because this gospel demands pouring over it, because it's written by a literary craftsman who carefully writes in a way that is going to have truths embedded in it, but you need to think a little bit about what he said. It's the gospel of John. And I'm going to be asking the author a few questions. The first one today is, John, tell me about Jesus in your gospel. And then we're going to be asking, who is the Father in this gospel? Who is the Spirit in this gospel? And our final session is, what about us? Talk to us, John, from your gospel. And then, as, as Pastor Chris has mentioned, on the Wednesdays, we're going to be exploring the Bible. I use that word quite deliberately. It's going to be an opportunity for us to explore, to discover. I hope to learn from you. I hope you will learn from me. And together, we will learn from the Spirit, who will impose himself on our gatherings and will inspire us. And as well as the things that you've already been told to bring with you, a pen, a smartphone, or a Bible, please bring your gift of curiosity and perhaps sneak in your gift of imagination, and that'll help you as we process our way through. It's going to be good opportunities <clears throat> for us together. And if you've still got a little bit more time for me in your lives, then I'll pray for you. But um, if you're happy with that, then we've also got some resources and we've got some books um, and some Bible study resources that are in the foyer just there. Please take a look at them. If you know me, the books are about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Just brought one up. This is a book about God. It's intended to be a gentle journey into an exploration of who He is, ideal for a young Christian or for an older Christian or even for a non-Christian. I wrote it because Judy, my wife, said we don't get enough sermons about God. We don't get enough books about God. And uh, she was right because the books that I was used to about God tend to be this thick and they're very complex because he's kind of complex, but they can be a bit off-putting. So I wrote that one. It's a lot thinner with a really nice cover and the contents aren't that bad as well. Have a look at that and see whether this could help you in your journey into God. And the other element of our resources are these Bible study resources, which are a combination of a DVD and a booklet, which are useful for your personal walk with the Lord or for life groups or churches use them as part of their Bible schools. Um, two little bonuses for you. Since Britain decided to leave the Euro, uh, the European uh, community, um, our sterling currency took a knock. So the Rand is now stronger against uh, sterling, so the books are cheaper. But also, there is a South African imprint on one of these. It's actually this one, because uh, Freddie, your Freddie, if you don't know Freddie, I'm sure you do, but he was the guy here standing leading us in worship. He's a talented musician, amongst other things. He's a bit annoying in that regard. He shouldn't have this much talent. I'm hoping God's going to take some of them away from him in time and give them to me. But um, I'm glad that I've got him while he's still got all those talents, because he introduces each of the talks on DVD with this lovely piece of orchestration. And um, it's so good, actually, we're going to roll it out on all the other DVDs I've produced. But I do need to warn you, because somebody, somebody came to see me at the end of the first session, and they said, which is the DVD that Freddie's on? And I realized that they were in danger of buying this, and then we're going to be disappointed, because there's rather more of me than Freddie on it. So 
However good Freddie is, unfortunately, he's just introducing the talks. So please don't buy it and then want your money back. Although what he says, or what he does, makes it worthwhile getting. So we've made it. We're here. 9,000 kilometers from London to Johannesburg, and we've got you. Um, it's remarkable, isn't it? We live in an age where travel is fairly straightforward, and uh, we can go from A to B quite quickly, and it doesn't cost us a huge amount of money. Very different in the first century. When you traveled in the first century, it was time-consuming and it was costly. So imagine if you're traveling from Jerusalem, you're one of the early Christians, and you're wanting to share your faith with people, and you want to go to the capital of the Roman Empire. That's Rome. That's three and a half thousand kilometers away. That's a little bit like from Johannesburg to Kinshasa in the north. In the first century, it would take you a long time from Jerusalem to Rome. It would take you about, not six hours, not even six days, not even six weeks. It would take you about six months. Travel was difficult. And it would cost you about four years of your annual salary. So travel in the first century is very difficult. That's why people don't travel very far. Many of them don't go outside their village. They don't go across the hill into the next village. It's too time consuming, it's too costly. But despite that, in the first century, Christians began to move into the Roman Empire and they began to make a mark. Despite the obstacles of travel and the cost of it and the time consuming nature of it, 50 years after Jesus has gone back to heaven, Christians are in what we know as modern day Europe. They haven't got to England yet, but they are in Germany. They are in Spain, they are in Italy. And they are settled in what we know as modern-day Turkey. They begin to drift into northern Africa, and they are in Tunisia. They are in Egypt, and they've drifted as far as India. Christians are making a mark on the world. The Church of Jesus is growing. But there's one group of Christians where it's not so evident, this growth. In fact, this particular group of Christians, well, if I'm honest, their enthusiasm, their initial enthusiasm is beginning to dissipate. They're slowing down in their ardent devotion for Jesus. The initial excitement is gone. It's not there. Just like Jesus isn't there anymore. Although he said he was coming back, that was 60 years ago, and he still hasn't come back. And the Christians, some of them, have him as a distant memory, but many of them never knew him in the flesh. And for them, he's an object of the past. He's no longer Jesus of the present in their lives. And so, in order to remedy this situation, they have begun to focus on events that are part of the Christian calendar and part of the Christian lifestyle, important events, but they focus on them because they help them remember Jesus. They give them an attachment to Jesus in the past. So they focus on water baptism, as we've seen reflected in that lovely testimony earlier. They focus on that as an institution because it reminds them of something Jesus did when he was on this earth, when he was baptized. And they focus on the Lord's Supper, which we're going to enjoy a little bit later. They focus on that because that reminds them of the time when Jesus instituted that Last Supper, that communion. But what's lacking is a sense of Jesus in the present. These are reminders of the past, and that, for too many of them, is where they think Jesus still is. And so John writes them a letter, one of Jesus' disciples. He writes them a letter. It's a long letter. We know it as the Gospel of John. And he writes for a specific reason to this group of Jewish Christians who are beginning to slow down in their relationship with Jesus. Here's the reason why he's writing his letter. Because he's written it 30 years or so after Matthew, Mark, and Luke have written theirs. So you might wonder, well, do we need another Gospel, John? but he's writing to a different age, to a different time, and to a different group of Christians. And his reasons for writing is this. I want to remind you, my readers, that Jesus is the Son of God. In fact, in chapter 20, verse 31, it's a bit late to tell the readers why he's writing it, but he puts it there. This is why I've written this gospel, so that you might be reacquainted with the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. 
So it's no surprise to us that in this gospel, he mentions Jesus referring to God as his father. He's the son. And Jesus does this over 100 times. The book is only 21 chapters long. 100 times Jesus identifies God as his father, which is more than double the occasions where that happens in Matthew and Mark and Luke put together. This is centrally of importance to John for his readers that they know that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, before I go further, let me just segue a little to remind you that being called a son in the first century is not a statement of inferiority on the part of the son in comparison to the father. It's not that you are only a son, but your father, of course, is much more important because he's father. In the first century setting, that's not how it works. To be the son of a father means that you are the best, the most accurate, the most comprehensive presentation of who your father is like. If your father can't be here and you as the son are here, then we don't need your father to come because we know what he's like. We know his DNA. We know his heartbeat. We listen to you. It's like listening to your father. We see you. It's like seeing your father. That's why Jesus is called the son of God when he's on this earth for 33 years. He's not called the uncle of God, or the brother of God, or the cousin of God, or the nephew of God, because those terms don't mean anything in the ancient world. He's called the son of God, not because he's inferior to God, because he's not. He is God. But son of God clicks it into their thinking, ah, so this is the way we are best able to see God who cannot be seen because he's a spirit being. We see him in this physical form of Jesus. Exactly. He's the son. So John writes his gospel because the Christians are beginning to think of Jesus as a hero, but a hero is associated with the past. Yes, he's a miracle worker, but it's in the past. Yes, he healed people, but it was in the past. Yes, he's our savior, but we associate that in the past. He once lived in Palestine. All true, but John wants to remind them that Jesus is living in the present, and on top of that, he is living in the present as God. And it is that reacquaintance with that truth that he knows is going to make a difference to their lives, to put their lives in a state of equilibrium and safety and stability, and is going to give them a fresh determination to develop their relationship, not with Jesus of the past, not with some hero of the past, not just with their savior and best friend, but with somebody who is their God. And so in the very first chapter, in the very first verse, in the very first few words, John says, Jesus is God. There's no mention of Jesus being born in the Gospel of John. There's no mention of him being a baby in the Gospel of John. There's no mention of him being in a manger in the Gospel of John. No mention of shepherds coming to see him in the manger. No mention of wise men coming to see him as a toddler. No mention of his father, Joseph. We don't even know in the Gospel of John that Jesus' mother is called Mary, even though she's mentioned a few times, and even though John is keenly interested in in Jesus' mother because Jesus gave his mother to him and said, please take care of my mother because... I'm dying on the cross. No, but John is not disregarding the humanity of Jesus, but he is prioritizing the godness. Remember, that's a word I've made up. It's a good word. The divinity of Jesus, the godness of Jesus, that's what John is interested in. He is God, always has been, always will be. So halfway through the gospel, And remember, in ancient writing, when you want to say something important, you don't just say it at the beginning, at the end, but you also put it right in the middle. And halfway through this gospel, chapter 10, we have Jesus saying, I and the Father are one. I and my Father are one. Please don't try to understand that. It's a contradiction in terms, but since Jesus says it, it's true. I and my Father are one. We're two separate beings. We have two separate personalities. But in reality, we are one. You can't put anything between us. We are one. It's another claim on the part of Jesus to his being God. He is divine. And then right towards the end of the chapter, we have another illustration which reminds us of the godness of Jesus because Thomas, one of the disciples of Jesus who wasn't there on the first occasion when Jesus introduced himself having been raised from the dead, but he's there on the second occasion. And Thomas comes to the conclusion that Jesus is, and I quote him, he says, you are my Lord and my God. And Jesus doesn't correct him. Jesus doesn't say, whoa, hold on now. 
you're elevating me too much. I'm not that high, but thank you. No, no, Jesus doesn't correct him because Jesus knows, and we know, and Thomas knew that he was right. He was his Lord, and he was his God. And throughout this gospel, permeating its pages and its verses are the fact that Jesus is God. So it's no surprise that in this gospel, a name is applied to Jesus that in the Old Testament was used of God, and we sang it in the last song that we sang together. The word is I am. Jesus refers to himself as I am. I am the bread of life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Seven times that's mentioned. Remember, John is a Jew writing to Jews. Numbers are important to them, and the number seven is a picture of perfection, completeness, comprehensiveness. Seven times Jesus identifies himself as I am, as if to make sure that we got the message. But what's most important is that the word I am is God's word. It's God's name. And Jesus applies it to himself. Who do you think you are, Jesus? You can't just do that. Well, not unless you're God. Are you? Remember the context where God revealed that that was his name? It was when Moses had been asked by God to rescue a people that God had chosen to be taken from slavery in, in Egypt and taken to the promised land that was waiting for them. And Moses says to God, because God spoke to him in the wilderness, in the desert, he says, well, I can, I can hear somebody, but I can't see you, so you must be some spirit being, some God, but um, I, I don't know you. So tell me who your name is, so that when I go to see the Pharaoh, I at least can say I'm representing the God whose name is, and he'll give some credence to the message. But at the moment, I haven't got a clue who you are. And God says, okay, Moses, say to the people, I am has sent you. Now, to my mind, it's a funny kind of a name, but it's God's name, and so it can't be that funny. I am has sent you. It's God's name. And Jesus, not John, Jesus uses that phrase to refer to himself. And John simply records it seven times just to make sure that we get the message. And throughout the gospel, John keeps reminding his readers of this truth. They were reminded that Jesus wasn't just their savior. He was their God who chose to save them. He wasn't just a prophet who deserves some measure of obedience. He's God who demands our complete obedience. He wasn't somebody who healed with the power of God to help him. No, no, he healed because he could, because he was God. And to leave this truth embedded in their minds as readers, he finishes off his gospel with a story. It's the last story. It's just 11 verses before the end of the gospel. So you can imagine that there must be something special in this story that he's left it right till the end. In fact, it's a story that's only in the Gospel of John. It is only, it's as if he said, this is my story. I'm going to include this one because it's so special for my readers. But what is so special about this story that he leaves it right till the end of the Gospel? Well, before we read it, you will notice there's a word that is used a few times in the telling of this story. It's in the original Greek, and our translators help, helpfully have included it. And it's the word revealed. And the story starts with Jesus revealing himself. It's a word that John uses, interestingly enough, seven times with regards to Jesus. Jesus reveals himself to the people, particularly to his disciples, seven times. He introduces himself. He manifests himself. He shows something of himself to those who are with him that they didn't know before. What's he going to reveal on this occasion? The last of those seven occasions. It's got to be special that he's left it till the end. Well, let me read the story to you. It's in chapter 21. It's going to come up on screen in a moment. And I'd like to read this story to you. And then we're going to unpack the story. Um, be encouraged. We are halfway through my talk. So if you thought that was an elongated introduction, well, it might have been, but we're halfway through the talk anyway. Here's the story. After this, Jesus, there you go, revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's Lake Galilee in the north of the land. And he revealed himself in this way. When you're reading these gospels, these, these books, be aware of the fact that these writers are literary craftsmiths and they use words carefully. They want us to stop, put yourself in that desert island, pause, think, why are you using that word? What is it trying to say to me? How many times have you used it before? 
Jesus revealed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Debedee, and two others of his disciples were together, seven of them. Simon said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, okay, we'll come with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. That's strange. Come back to that. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? I need to help you here because the original Greek has the capacity to be able to ask a question with an implied answer. And that's what happens here. Our translators haven't done a brilliant job because actually what Jesus says is, you haven't caught any fish, children, have you? Implied answer, no, we haven't because Jesus knew that they hadn't caught fish. I'll come back to that as well. He said to them, well, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some fish. So they did. And now they weren't able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, the writer of this gospel, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment because he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. They weren't far from the land. They were about 100 yards off. And when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the fish excuse me, hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, interestingly, the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have some breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So there we have the story the last story in the Gospel of John, the last miracle in the Gospel of John. He's introduced us to seven miracles, has John in his Gospel. This is the seventh, the final miracle. What's so special about this miracle? It didn't seem to compare with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. He's just enabled a few more fish to be caught. There must be something about this miracle that I'm missing. Well, let's remind ourselves of the context. The disciples have gone fishing. It's about 10 days since Jesus has been raised from the dead and has introduced him, himself to them as the resurrected Jesus, and they've got over the initial shock of that occasion because they weren't expecting it. Although Jesus had told them it would happen, they weren't expecting it. It did happen, and now they are living in a state of euphoria. They're loving life because Jesus is alive. And he's told them he's got some work for them to do, but he said, it's okay, relax. Don't start it yet, please don't start it yet, because some things have got to happen first, so you just enjoy. And here they are, they've got a couple of hours to spare, it's the end of the day, night is coming, some of them are fishermen, what should we do? Let's go fishing. That's the time when you go fishing in, in Galilee, it's the time when the fish are ready to jump, so they go fishing. But here's the unusual fact, they catch nothing. That's a miracle in itself, in a lake teeming full of fish. They catch nothing, and then this stranger on the shore at dawn talks to them. Now, they're fed up. They're exhausted. They've been throwing the net over the boat, letting it lie, and then pulling it in, hoping that there will be some fish there. And they've dragged it all the way into the boat, and there's not one tiddler. And they throw it out again, and they pull it back in, and it's sodden, and it's heavy, and their muscles are straining, and there's nothing. And they throw it in again, and back and forth, and back and forth. And now, at the end of the night, they are exhausted. And this stranger says, you haven't caught any fish, have you? Throw it over the other side. And they do. Now, this is the third occasion in which Jesus has revealed himself to those disciples since the resurrection. Remember I said seven times in the gospel, Jesus has revealed himself. Since the resurrection of Jesus, he's revealed himself three times. I wonder what he revealed on those times. Revelation number one. He meets the disciples on the first occasion and he says, I've got a couple of things to tell you. I've got a couple of things I'm going to introduce to you that you didn't know were coming. Number one, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. When? Now. 
Wow. That's a remarkable manifestation of your authority that you can do that, Jesus. Oh, I've got something else as well. I want to tell you what you're going to be doing when I give you permission to start. You are going to have the authority to forgive sins. Up till now, I'm the one who's done that, but now I'm giving it to you. To us? Yes, to you. A remarkable revelation. As Jesus manifests something of his heart for what's going to happen in the future when he goes to heaven and they take over the mantle of his responsibilities while he was on earth. What's the second revelation, Jesus? Well, this is a revelation that's focused on Thomas, but everybody benefits from it. Remember Thomas, one of his disciples, wasn't there on the first occasion when Jesus appeared, and he's had trouble believing that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's too good to be true. He would love it to be true, but for goodness sake, it can't be true. And then Jesus does a couple of things. First of all, he appears in the room where they were, but he doesn't open the door to get in. He doesn't climb through the window. He just appears through the wall, wherever he wasn't there and he is there. Something is a bit special about his body. And then he says to Thomas, come and touch me. Now, maybe Thomas thought, if I touch him, I'm going to put my fingers all the way through him because he's clearly a spirit force if he can move through inanimate objects. But when he touches him, he feels the marks, the scars, the imprints of the nails that were put into Jesus' physical body. And he realizes that Jesus is truly alive, the victor of death. That's the second revelation. Jesus is the authority figure over death who decided to die. Death didn't take him. He decided to die, walked through death, did some things while he was dead, and then came back to life. Fantastic revelation. Well, now, John, what's going to be the third revelation, the final revelation? What are you going to tell me about Jesus? What is he going to say about himself that's going to make me even more thrilled with those, than those previous revelations? Well, as far as I can tell about this story as we've read it, it's simply that Jesus gives some fish to fishermen. And I can't help but feel a certain level of anticlimax. You gave so much before Jesus, and now you're just giving fish. Have you run out of things to give? Have we run out of everything about you that can make us in awe of you? And now you've decided simply to throw in, oh, by the way, I can provide some fish when you need it. Well, you know, Jesus has got more to offer than that. So what can we learn about this miracle? And I've got three suggestions, but you might have already identified others. But here's the first. This is the first thing I think John wants his readers to know. It's the first thing that Jesus wants his disciples to know. It's the first thing today that Jesus wants you and me to know, and it's this. Jesus knew that the disciples had failed. He knew that they had failed to catch fish. He didn't say, have you caught fish? He said, you haven't caught any fish, have you? You failed. All night you've tried and you have failed. What an embarrassment. Can you imagine those poor disciples? Some of them are fishermen. It's what they've done for their lives. Some of them have got fishing companies as part of their families. And here, after a night's fishing in a lake that's full of fish, at the best time when you fish at night, in a boat that's full of fishing equipment with muscles and abilities and skills and experience and expertise that should result in them catching fish, they haven't caught a single tiddler. Please, Jesus, don't tell anybody. Don't shout this abroad. Keep your voice down. Our reputation is at stake here. We have failed. I suspect that if Jesus had responded to such a response, if there had been one, he would have said something like this. I'm not telling anybody that you failed, but I'm telling you that you failed. Not because I want you to crawl on the floor in embarrassment, mortified with the fact that I know your failings. I'm telling you because you need to know that I know that you failed. But I haven't finished the sentence yet. I've got some more things to say. That's just the start. Despite the fact that you have failed, in acknowledgement of the fact that you have failed, knowing full well that at your best you will still fail, I want to let you know that I know the way to succeed. And I will make sure that you do succeed because that is the revelation that I'm sharing with you about myself. I know you're a failure. I know you have failings. I know you have inadequacies, but none of them will be an obstacle for you succeeding because I'm getting involved. And when I get involved, there's going to be a difference. For you, 
for me, it is no surprise to Jesus when we fail. It's not shock and horror in heaven as the angels run around wondering who's going to be the one to tell the Father that Keith has failed. He knows I'm going to fail. I'm not acknowledging that in a sense of lackadaisicalness, but I am pleased that he knows that I cannot achieve my aspirations, let alone his aspirations, but it doesn't stop him from still anticipating that I and you can succeed in doing what he wants us to do because despite our failings, he says, I'm going to get involved. And he does that with the disciples who in their three years with Jesus have done their fair share of failings. But in this story, the message is, I am coming to make a difference. You will succeed. Lesson number one. Lesson number two, the way to success is obedience. Success in our lives as Christians is not down to our charisma, our personality, our strengths, our abilities necessarily, our intelligence, our wealth, our persona, our status in society. That doesn't make much difference in terms of succeeding and achieving what God wants. What makes a difference in achieving what God wants is when we simply obey. When we say, okay, I'll try and do what you're asking me to do. On the basis of that, Jesus says, excellent, you've succeeded. I haven't done anything yet. Oh, yes, you have. You've said, yes, I will obey you. Let me now do the rest. I'll take advantage of your obedience, and you can watch as how I can make a difference to your activities, and together we will achieve more than you can imagine. Ah, and that's the point. I don't think John is simply giving us a message here about obedience leads to success, although that's a valid message, and we could think about it quite a bit. But there's an extra special little bonus that John is offering here. It's the quality of the success in the activity when Jesus gets involved. Remind yourselves of the story. They catch fish. The story could end there, but John says, oh, no, 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 I've got some details for you. They caught a lot of fish. How many? A couple of dozen? No, no, it was over 100. 100 fish. Yes. In fact, it was over 150. In fact, I can tell you exactly how many fish there were. 153 fish. John, are you being pedantic? Is that the kind of thing you like to do? No. It's just that we were so in awe of what had been achieved that we laid them out. We counted them out. Do you see what we've got? 153. Can you imagine the humor, the laughter, the slapping of shoulders, the clapping of hands? This is what Jesus has achieved for us when we simply obeyed him and threw the net over the other side. Oh, and by the way, they're large fish, big fish. Now, I think I want to say to Jesus, Jesus, that was completely unnecessary. They cannot possibly accommodate all those fish. There's seven disciples and you, Jesus. That's eight of you. That's nearly 20 large fish each. One fish alone will be quite sufficient to fill you up for the rest of the day, if not the weekend. And you've given them another 19 each. And you've got cooking on the beach some fish anyway with bread. Jesus, for goodness sake, this is unnecessary. I think Jesus, if he was here, would just smile in my direction and say, Keith, He's still not learning about me, are you? I don't give little bits and bobs to my people when they obey me. I'm not a dripping tap who gives just enough and no more. I like to give, and I like to give liberally because I am lavish, and I can because I'm God. So in the very first part of the Gospel of John, when you have that wedding in Cana of Galilee, and they run out of wine, they've drunk the party dry, Jesus turns up, and what does he do? Give them a couple of extra bottles of red wine? A flagon or two? No, he gives 160 gallons of wine. Jesus, for goodness sake, this is unnecessary. It's too much. We can't accommodate it. I'm sorry, it's who I am. I just can't help but giving because this is who I am. I'm lavish. I give super abundantly because I am God. And although your perception of God may be that he doesn't function like that, he lives on the other side of the universe and once in a blue moon touch wood, he might come and touch your life and give you a little drop of something nice that might go in a moment of time. That is a figment of your imagination. Don't go there. It's not who God is. And halfway through the Gospel of John drops another little story in where he has thousands of people who are fed by Jesus because they're hungry. And the food that Jesus gives to the people does not just stave off their hunger. It fills them to the full. But here's the point. At the end of the story, there's more food left over than there was at the beginning. Jesus, what are you trying to tell me? Do I need to know that? Yes, you do. Because otherwise you will think that I deal with you in a niggardly way. And I don't. 
Because remember, I know your failings. I know your inadequacies. I know your weaknesses. I know you don't deserve me to treat you in the way that I treat you, but I can't help it because this is who I am. I am your God, not just somebody who lives in the past, but your God. This is the message that John wants the readers to know. This is the message that John wants us to know, that when Jesus gives, he gives liberally. He gives he gives generously. He gives super abundantly because he's that kind of God. He is wow. That's the word that you use when something sensational happens and you don't have another word that you can express to, to show your level of amazement. That's Jesus. He's associated with the concept of wow. He preceded everything. He created everything. He has the ability to give anything and everything that he wants because he's God. And then my final point, because something else happened after they obeyed. They didn't just catch fish. That would have been wonderful. But something else happened, because when they get to the beach, Jesus comes to the climax of the occasion. John puts it in as the climax of the story. Jesus says, I've got something else for you, not just fish. I've got a commission. And it's focused on Peter, but the others will share this commission. And the commission in the language of the day is, I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to look after the Christians. I want you to nurture them, to train them, to lead them, to teach them. I want you to pastor them. I want you to shepherd them. In effect, I want you to do what I have done up till now. I want you to do it. Can you imagine Peter, metaphorically or even physically, just taking a step backwards as if he hopes that he is not included in that commission because it's just too big an ask? How can I do that, Jesus, for goodness sake? <laughs> it's one thing for you to do it, but you know me. I'm a failure. I failed. I can't even catch fish. Do you think I didn't know that, Peter? But you see what I did? Ah, yes, I did. You see, that's the miracle of the commission is that when Jesus gives Peter a commission, he does it on the back of a demonstration of his remarkable power. And the implication is therefore obvious. When he commissions Peter, he does it with Peter having the ability to recognize that he has all the support network to ensure that he can fulfill the commission that Peter has been given. If Peter can't do it in his own strength, there is a backup source. And that backup source is not some distance in the background. It is present with him because God, Jesus, is not somebody who lives in the past. He is somebody who lives in the present, and he lives in the presence as God. So you, you have commissions that God has given to you, and some of them are part of your vocation in life, be you functioning in a church setting or be you functioning in the marketplace. Who you are, your creative skills, your gifts are God's commission to you to function in that regard in your community, in your business, in your street, in your family, in your university, wherever you happen to be. But here's what I want to say. Do not get too caught up by your inadequacies and your failings in those respects. Bear in mind that the one who has commissioned you, the one who has called you, number one knows, and number two says, I can make you succeed. I can ensure that you can achieve what you are doing to the benefit of your community, to the glory of me, because I, I, the creator of the universe, have chosen to get involved in your life. Wow. I understand, John, why you kept this story right to the end. Because if I can pick up just a smidgen of that truth, it has the potential of revolutionizing my life as I view the commission that Jesus has given to me. But then this week, through this week, Jesus will give you commissions. He will give you suggestions as to what you might do. Small suggestions, just like the one that he gave to the disciples. Listen, lads, just throw your net over the boat on the other side. It's a small commission, and he will ask us to get involved. He will call us to serve with him, to serve for him. Here's the point. Be prepared to be surprised with what will result on the basis of our simple acknowledgement. Are you asking me, Jesus, to get involved? Okay, I'll do what you're asking, what I sense your spirit is telling me to do. Um, be surprised as to what will happen, because he's God because he's present. He's not just present here on Sundays. He's not present here when we're all together. He's present in an hour's time, tomorrow morning, eight o'clock. He'll be present and he's present as God. This story of Jesus helping disciples catch fish happened once before in their lives. 
There was another occasion when they couldn't catch fish, and Jesus ensured that they could, and it was a supernatural catch. It happened at the start of their journey three years earlier, and as a result of that, they began to follow Jesus. And now three years later, Jesus reenacts that miracle just for them, but with extra lessons. Two, number one, on the first occasion, Jesus was in the boat with them. On this occasion, he's not in the boat. He's 100 meters away on the land. Does it make any difference to Jesus whether he is physically proximate to them or not? Absolutely not. He still achieved the miracle. And whether he's 100 meters from us or a million miles from us or on the other side of the universe, it doesn't matter because he's God. And therefore, he has the capacity to bring his supernatural resources into our lives to make a difference to us and to our communities. But then secondly, and finally, when the disciples saw that first miracle of Jesus achieving a supernatural catch of fish, they followed him because they saw him as a rabbi with extra powers. But this time, three years later, and John mentions it three times, they recognize that Jesus is their Lord, their God. It took three years in the learning, but they're getting there. Sorry, Jesus, that it took you three years before you could go back to heaven for you to get the message into our brains that you are our God. But now we've got it. Please go. We can handle it because now we know that you're with us right now as God to ensure that we can continue the journey. And that's the message he offers to you and me. He is able to leave his commissions, his aspirations, his targets, his objectives in our countries to us for us to continue the work, but he says, please take advantage of my presence, take advantage of my resources. We're doing it together. And remember, I know you're inadequate. That's why I'm doing it with you. Well, let me pray. Lord Jesus, I can hardly believe the truth of that which I'm expressing. I suspect that I'm a little different to the people in John's audience who also would have focused very heavily on their failings, on my failings, and therefore assumed that that would be an obstacle for you achieving what you want to achieve on this earth. And I would have been looking for others who could help you better. But thank you for this reminder that you know our failings. And despite them, you say, I, I know how you can succeed. And I can't help but imagine that you have a smile on your face when you say that. And then you say, and I'm coming in to help. Well, Lord, would you open our minds to this truth so that it will result in our expectation that you will surprise us this week. Please do that. Amen. Well, now we're going to spend some time in communion sharing the Lord's table together. If you've not done this before, you don't know what it's about, you're going to be given a little wafer and a little uh, goblet of um, juice. And it's a, a reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus, his body represented by the wafer and his blood that was shed represented by the juice. When you receive it, please take it and we will share them together later. Thank you, Keith, for such an encouraging word and that we're never alone. We've got someone that uh, is on our side, will never leave us nor forsake us. If he's for us, who can be against us? This is a beautiful moment for us just to remember the most victorious act in history. Jesus comes to earth, lives a sinless life, gives his blood, his life, so that we can have life for all eternity. And that he solves the separation problem through his sacrifice. And this is a moment where we can just reflect and remember he did this because he loves you, he loves me, he loves this whole world. And so that we can have peace with him for all eternity. Peace now, peace tomorrow, peace forever. Because we have his presence living in us, all made available through his death, his burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so can we just bow our heads if you haven't received the emblems yet, the ushers will be with you. This is a moment just for us just to remember what Jesus has done for you, for us. 
that you can be one with God, that you and I are one with God, that we are right in His sight all because of what He has done. It's a moment for us to also just be filled with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for the price paid, the path that He's shown us, that all we're going to do, as we've heard today, just follow Him. The success comes in just following Him, and He gives us the power to do what He's called us to do. That's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit. All we're going to do is just yield to the Spirit, yield to Him. Just be led by Him. Just to examine our own hearts and maybe there's just been a striving and God's just wanting to call, call us back to a place of rest, His effortless rhythms of His grace. Peace, be still. Power to the weary, power to the weak, power, Lord, you resource us to do your purpose, to do your will, and we just receive that now. We thank you for the bread, Lord, that represents your body, and Lord, just reminding us of the closeness, the power of your presence, that we could be whole, Lord, your broken body, so that we can be whole and forgiven. Let's partake together. In the cup, representing the blood and the new covenant that washes us, redeems us, forgives us, totally forgives us, makes us new. Let's partake. Oh God, you're a good God. We thank you that we can depend on you every day. Lord, we thank you that you give us bread on a daily basis, Lord. You give us water for our souls. Lord, you give us guidance and peace and strength. Lord, we just thank you for this time that, Lord, that you would just be the after speaker to what we've heard and what we've received and what we've experienced here. We thank you, God, that you go with us, Lord, into our present, in our present and into our future. We thank you, God, for your grace and your peace to be multiplied to every person here in Jesus' name. And, Lord, even for those, Lord, that have maybe never crossed the line of faith, maybe that's you this morning, you've never begun a new life in Jesus, all you're going to do is just call upon Jesus as your Savior, the one who can save us from our sins call on him as your Lord, your leader to lead your life to can take control of your life simply just say Jesus be my savior Jesus be my Lord I open the door of my heart and welcome you in, rule and reign in me in Jesus name Amen